Today is April 14th, 2024, and we're going to do something a little bit different today. Last month marked the 18-year anniversary of EconTalk. If all goes as planned, this will be episode 943, which is kind of amazing. Uh, a little bit hard for me to believe. That means that we're about a year away from episode 1000, barring any surprises to my health, the world, things I can't anticipate. Uh, I hope to do something special for that 1000th episode if we get there, but I thought it appropriate to mark the 18-year anniversary. We started in March of 2006. Uh, the number 18 represents life in the Jewish tradition. The word for life in Hebrew is chai, which is spelled with two Hebrew letters, chet and yud. Chet is the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Yud is the tenth letter, which gets you to 18, which is why... Uh, Jews often make donations to charity in multiples of 18, 180, 1,800, and so on, 360. So, 18 years seems like a nice uh, landmark, and I thought it'd be useful to do a little bit of reflection. Uh, in addition, I want to give you the results of our annual survey and say some things about the Econ Talk episodes of 2023, uh, your favorites, and a few other things, as well as responding to some comments in that survey. So first, some survey results. Um, 1,105 people voted. Uh, one bit of feedback I asked you for is, how do you usually listen? 29% 20, of you usually listen while commuting, 17% while exercising, 13% exercising, while doing household chores, and 21% said there is no most of the time. Um, here are your favorite episodes as you voted. Uh, it's a funky list, um, for reasons not worth going into. I'll do it in reverse order, uh, 10th down through first, the top 10 most popular or favorite episodes of yours in your voting. 10th, the tie, Dwayne Betts on Beauty, Prison, and Redaction, Lydia Dugdale on The Lost Art of Dying. Uh, the seventh most uh, popular was a three-way tie. Yeah, I think so, which is why it get, the numbers are funny the way they are. Uh, Adam Mastriani on peer review in the academic kitchen. Yossi Klein Alevi on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Vinay Prasad on pharmaceuticals, the FDA, and the death of duty. Uh, fifth place, Vinay Prasad on cancer screening tie. Vinay Prasad on cancer screening, Peter Atia on lifespan, health span, and outlive. Tie for second place, a three-way tie, Tyler Cowan on the GOAT of economics, that is the greatest of all time, Roland Fryer on race, diversity, and affirmative action, and Michael Munger on obedience to the unenforceable. First place, the most popular or your favorite episode of the year of 2023 was an extraordinary introduction to the birth of Israel in the Arab-Israeli conflict with Chaviv Redigur. And um, that, I think, uh, got 34% of, of all ballots. 34% uh, of you who voted said that was in your top five. Um, a couple of thoughts on that list of top 10. Uh, there were two episodes with Vinay Prasad. There were two of the 10 on what we might call traditional economics or economists, Tyler Cowen and uh, Roland Fryer. And uh, there were two episodes on Israel, the Haviv Redigur and the uh, Yossi Klein Alevi. I want to say something about the way I choose guests. Um, I choose guests based on stuff that interests me or that I want to figure out. My favorite conversations are when I make an unusually powerful connection or have a rapport with the guest or I learn something important. Um, as an example of the former of having that connection, uh, certainly this year's episode of 2024 with Charles Duhigg on conversation 
Uh, we had a wonderful rapport. I don't know Charles. I've never met him before. Never met him in person. But something was special about that conversation. I, I cherish those. But I also, of course, cherish the ones where I learned something important. And I want to give a couple examples of those. Actually, a, an amazing thing happened to me recently. I was talking to um, an old-time listener, and he said he has never forgotten the lesson that he learned from Paul Gregory on politics, murder, and love in Stalin's Kremlin. That's a 2010 episode with Paul Gregory. And this person I was talking to said that what he learned from that episode that was so extraordinary is that you could wield power without being at the top of the pyramid. And Stalin wielded power as the general secretary uh, in the Kremlin. Um, and that he wasn't at the top, but he had control of various things through that position. And it soon became, through his use of it and application, the most powerful piece, uh, the most powerful position. And what this listener learned is that sometimes controlling the agenda or who is nominated to a board can be as important as who's the chair of the board. And I thought that was a fascinating insight that this person learned from a pretty obscure uh, episode of Econ Talk back in 2010, which was about Bukharin, who was an early um, communist who Stalin eventually killed. Uh, it's a great book, Paul Gregory's book. Uh, it's a great episode, but he, that listener got something out of that that I'd forgotten. I never remembered learning it. And I think What's amazing is that if, if you made a list of the one thing or the two things, if there are one or two things you learn from an episode, uh, it's quite probably quite different for different people. Um, I, think, uh, I think it was A.J. Jacobs in an episode talked about the power of one thing. And he tries to write one thing he learned from a book or one thing he learned from an interview. And uh, I just wanted to share a few I learned this year that, uh, 2023 that I thought were interesting or important for me personally. Uh, one would be the insight from Adam Mastriani's uh, episode, uh, not the one that was voted into the top 10. That was um, a different one, but he also had an episode on how you can't reach the brain through the ears. And that's a very unintuitive idea. In fact, you would think the only way to reach the brain is through the ears. So the idea that you can't reach the brain through the ears, that by telling people things or lecturing them or haranguing them doesn't teach them things, they often either ignore or forget that and and focus on what they learn through experience or other methods of education, uh, reading. And I like the idea, of course, of close reading and seminars. That's what we do here at a lot at Shalom College as a way to have lessons be absorbed that are not absorbed when you're talked at. That's a, I mean, I've thought about that so many times after having that conversation. Of course, I read that originally in an essay by Adam, but having talked to him about it and then thought about it some more, it finally got into my brain. Uh, of course, I'm pretty sure we talked ironically about the irony in that episode. In that episode, I'm pretty sure we talked about the irony of listening to someone tell you you can't reach the brain through the ears. Um, another example would be the episode with Mike Munger, uh, obedience to the unenforceable. That phrase, obedience to the unenforceable, the idea that we can be loyal and obedient to norms that are not enforced through the state, but are enforced, not literally enforced then, but encouraged through social forces it was a very powerful idea. We talked many, many times on this program about the difference between law and legislation. Legislation being things that the legislature passes and law being things that, uh, even though that word law is used sometimes for legislate, legislation, it's better, according to Hayek, likes to reserve it for um, norms and expectations of behavior that emerge rather than uh, those that are passed by a, a top-down form like a legislature. But I love that formulation, obedience to the unenforceable. And of course, that episode and that conversation and the power of that and how it has diminished over time that the unenforceable is less uh, salient to us 
and those norms and and social forces are very different than they used to be. It was a, was a great uh, insight for me. And finally, I'd point to how you've read a Gore's episode where he talked about most Israelis, more than half of the people who live in the country of Israel right now, were essentially refugees, either from the aftermath of the Holocaust or uh, were thrown out of uh, Middle Eastern countries, Arab countries where they had lived for a long time. And that this did not, this reality that most of the people who live here in Israel do not have any place to go home to is an important reality that, according to Haviv, whether he's right or not, is not the, the, the main thing. But he, point, he argues that the Palestinian narrative and their st- strategy is often predicated on uh, f- creating an unpleasant enough environment here in Israel that people would give up and leave uh, when, in fact— uh, we have nowhere to turn to. There, there's a. I happen to. I have two passports. I have an American passport and an Israeli one, but most Israelis do not. Um, Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah, recently made a claim similar to the claim that Haviv is critiquing, saying that Israelis should go back to their other country. They should go back to Brooklyn or wherever. But most Israelis don't come from Brooklyn. They come from Tehran and and uh, other places, um, Yemen and uh, post-World War II Poland, where they either don't want to go back or can't, uh, literally can't go back. So I thought those were, it changed the way I looked at this country uh, where I live. So those are the ones that are most precious to me. Um, And I'm sure yours are different. Uh, What what speaks to you and what are are important to you are different. Um, I want to thank everybody who, who commented, um, and many of you did, and many of them were positive and gracious and nice, which I appreciate about how We Can Talk has helped you in your personal life and the way you speak to others who you don't agree with. And it's fascinating and a little bit weird to me that much of this program has become, its value to you is, is, is a cultural value, not an educational value of the normal sense of learning about economics. Um, I think that's wonderful. It's a beautiful example of an emergent uh, phenomenon, of course. Now, uh, one of you commented in the survey uh, that the focus this year on artificial intelligence in Israel, quote, bummed me out. Uh, I understand that. And another common theme in the comments is we should have more economics. Um, you know, I should say this show, which started off as literally econ talk and is now much more the subtitle of the program, Conversations for the Curious, you know, it's what it's really about are the things that I'm interested in or I'm trying to figure out. So typically what I've been doing, I think over the last, I don't know how long, five to 10 years of the program is something happens. The most dramatic example might be the financial crisis. And I realize I don't know enough about it. And so I interview a lot of smart people and ask questions that I want to have answered and I assume that you're interested in so that you too can go on this journey of exploration and discovery with me and figure these things out. So we did a lot of episodes on artificial intelligence. I had a couple more planned, not too many more, don't worry, for those of you who are tired of it. But it's kind of an important issue, I think. Uh, Some people thought it's a threat to the future of humanity. So I wanted to figure out whether I should be worried about it or not. Uh, The answer is a little bit, not not as much as I think that most worried people are feeling. Um, We should be aware of it. We should be aware of its uh, potential to do harm like anything else. But I thought that was important, and I was curious about it. And similarly, I moved here to Israel three years ago uh, on October 7th. Uh, We endured an unimaginable attack of of horror. And I wanted to understand the history of that better than I than I did. Um, you'd think as an American Jew who's interested in Israel, I would be an educated on I'd be educated on the topic. I was not. Uh, I know a little something, but uh, I've learned a lot from the ten plus episodes we've done on on the Arab Israeli conflict. Uh, the Palestinians, and so on. Um, 
you know, one of the things that's striking when you live here is how hard it is to appreciate what it's like to live here, unless you do. And, um, you know, it's funny. I'm recording this on April 14th. Last night, Iran uh, bombarded Israel with drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. Um, I awoke at two two o'clock in the morning. Uh, excuse me, I didn't awake. The country awoke. I was actually awake. I, my wife was sleeping next to me. I was trying to figure out what was going on still. And I heard an incredibly loud boom. It did not wake up my wife, but it sure scared me. I didn't know what it was. It sounded like a missile had landed. Then I heard two more, and then the air raid sirens went off. And at that point, uh, you're supposed to run to, a, you have 90 seconds to get to a safe room. Uh, our apartment doesn't have a safe room. It's an old building. And so we ran into the stairwell with our son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter who had been visiting us, uh, along with uh, people in the apartment across the hall. Uh, and we huddled there uh, and and heard another boom. And those booms were Iron Dome and other uh, defensive uh, programs that Israel has. They also have uh, David Sling and Arrow. These are uh, anti-missile defense systems, which, as you know by now, worked incredibly well last night. It might not work well every time. Hezbollah in the north has supposedly tens of thousands of missiles, not hundreds, uh, that they could launch at at Israel. But point being that two points. One is that I, I really think it's important to understand some of what's going on in this on this issue for almost everyone, not literally everyone, but I think a lot of people are curious about it and realize, like myself, they don't know enough about it. And secondly, I'm pretty tired, <laughs> so I'm recording this sort of on fumes. I, uh, you know, I went back to bed at, after the air raid siren stops. I think you're supposed to wait ten minutes for debris to stop falling, and then you go, you can go back to your house. So we went out of, back out of the stairwell after about ten minutes into went back to bed. It wasn't my best night's sleep, obviously, um, and it's um, well. We'll see what the next days bring. It's going to be a very interesting time and you know i'm sitting uh, i like to call it the i'm sitting in the front row of, of history right now which is both exhilarating and frightening it was very scary last night uh especially for my my children and and grandchild but um turned out okay but it seems like that's something i'm going to want to understand a little bit better and so i'm going to do a little more on israel than i am on say uh fiscal and monetary policy or bitcoin and that's just the way the program's gone. It's um, you know I'm very grateful to Liberty Fund who who found, who funds the program that they've allowed me to uh, follow my interests uh, beyond economics. But that's the reality of the program. I don't mind being told this, that you want more economics. I'm happy to hear it, but it's just economics is not what I'm so interested in anymore. I'm more interested in what makes life meaningful. I'm more interested in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm more interested in human frailty. I'm more interested in decision-making. So, you know, you're on a journey with me, most of you. Some of you have just started, but many of you have been listening for a long time. And you've been with me to, as I've explored these topics and you've heard my questions change depending on who I'm talking to. And um, I hope that's interesting. It's not for everybody. I understand that. And for those of you who miss the old days, uh, where we were all economics all the time, uh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of Bitcoin. There are listeners who wish we did a Bitcoin episode every week. Um, we don't because... I feel like I've learned everything that I can feasibly, reasonably learn from talking to smart people about it. Doesn't mean I know everything about it, I don't. But the marginal benefit of learning a little bit more is very small. You know, I figured out from the Bitcoin episodes we've done over the years, how, how roughly how it works, not exactly, but roughly, 
what's the likelihood it's going to survive? What's the likelihood it's going to make it? How is it like money? How is it not like money? Why it might be important? Why it might be overhyped? And so on. And at that point, you know, there is there are a few more things to learn. Again, I don't mean to suggest I'm an authority on Bitcoin. I'm not. And I'm not an authority on the financial crisis. And I'm not an authority on the Israeli or Palestinian conflict. But I've tried to get smarter. And, and my goal is to help you get smarter. So I hope that is of interest to you. Um, if I'm not interested, it's not going to be a good interview. Um, I'm sure there are listeners out there who can tell when I'm not so interested in the topic or the speaker. Sometimes I'll invite someone on the program having read, say, the first chapter of the book, only to discover that the remaining chapters are not as interesting as the first one. And it's hard for me to be enthusiastic about it. I don't ever want to do that. It happens from time to time, but I generally don't don't want to do that. Um, some of you asked for Econ Talk merchandise. We have it. We'll put a link to this program at, for the notes for this episode uh, of where you can find it. You know, we have T-shirts, we have baseball caps. Um, I think we have beach blankets. Um, onesies, you know, the important things. Um, so they're out there. Love for you to coffee cups. We, we'd love for you to spread the word with e for Econ Talk through our um, merchandise selection. They're priced to basically break even. Um, so we're not trying to make money on it. It's just a way for you to be part of the team and uh, join the club. Uh, a couple more things and before uh, I close this out, and the first is that I wanted to add something uh, about last week's episode with Paul Bloom, which is about immortality and digital like living a digital existence rather than a quote real existence. This, you know, one of the issues that came up was the experience machine, the idea of Robert Nozick that you would tie yourself to a machine. And you would you would imagine it would feel like you were doing all the things you had programmed the machine to make you feel, but in fact, you would just be plugged into the machine. So while it would feel like you had cured cancer or won the Masters or become president of the United States or ha you're a great rock star, you're not actually. You're just feeling what it like what it's like to experience that. But in reality, you're laying on a on a table uh, hooked up to the machine. And one of the things we talked about in the program was, in that episode, was that if you are a religious person uh, or you believe in God, that there's something um, troubling about the experience machine. And, and I talked about the soul, and I, and I also talked about that with respect to, uh, you know, creating an avatar of one's loved one uh, or communing with famous people or dead people through AI avatars. And I, I missed what I wanted to say that was the most important thing. So I thought I'd add it here, which is that if you lead a religious life or believe in God, you think you're supposed to achieve something with your life. Now, of course, you don't have to be religious or believe in God to feel that way. Many people who are not religious, purely secular, atheists, lead a secular, unreligious, non-religious life, feel that their life should have purpose and that they should try to do things to make the world better. But certainly religious people feel that. And what I should have made clear is the reason I find the experience machine uh, interesting is that it forces you to recognize that. And I think, I don't know where I saw this, but I'm pretty sure that people are more willing to be on the experience machine than they were when Nozick proposed it back in the uh, early 1970s. When Nozick proposed it, if you did a survey, and if, again, I saw this somewhere, I don't remember where, but it, it rings true. If you did a survey of people and said, would you like to be on the experience machine? And you could feel like you'd done all these amazing things. And most people would say, oh, no, that'd be weird. But younger people today are more likely to be interested in the experience machine. And 
My only observation, which I think I was trying to make in that conversation with Paul, which I didn't do very well, is that I think if you if you aspire to a religious life or to a connection to the divine, at least in the Judeo-Christian uh, perspective, the one I know better than others, uh, you're supposed to do something with your life. God put you here for a purpose. You may not know what it is. You may struggle to discover it. But laying on a table and feeling good, but not actually doing good, would be problematic for most religious people. Again, it would be problematic for many people, religious or not religious. But I think they're related. And I, that was the point I wanted to make. I don't think I made it, uh, as far as I remember. That episode hasn't aired yet as I'm recording this, uh, but it will have aired last week. Um, and anyway, I wanted to add that. Uh, it's often the case that in the... Um, Aftermath of an episode, I think of things I should have said or should have said better. And if I, if Econ Talk was my full time job, I would spend, I'd be able to spend more time on these kind of, you know, post mortems. But um, it's not my full time job, uh, so I, I do the best I can. But I, I wanted to add that since it was just last week. Um, before I forget, I want to thank the team at Liberty Fund. And all the people who helped me with um, Econ Talk, uh, Lauren Landsberg, Amy Willis, Katie Flavin, Les Cook, Marla Goldfinger, and to the foundation for its its support. And of course, to my sound engineer, Rich Goyette, who does the heaviest of the lifting. Uh, many of those people have been with the program for from the very beginning. Some have been added uh, to help along the way but I couldn't do it without them. And I certainly couldn't do it um, with my responsibilities here at Shalem College. So I'm very grateful to, to that group for all that they do. I wanna close with a story. Um, I, I think it will uh, interest you. Uh, and I tell it with my mom's permission because uh, it's a story about my mom and uh, a recent challenge she had. And it's it gets at many of the issues that that we've spoken about on the program that I alluded to earlier. Um, Decision-making, human frailty, um, self-deception, self-awareness, uh, human flourishing, a meaningful life, and so on. So here's a story about my mom. My... Mom is 91 years old. She lives on her own, which is a wonderful thing. And she has her own house. Until six months ago, she drove her own car, which is amazing. But now she sold her car. She relies on Uber. And uh, I don't know, a couple months ago or so, she called me to say that she'd done something stupid. She'd fallen. But she was okay, she said. She was at a local emergency clinic, and they were um, going to give her a, an x-ray and see if she broke anything. And that she was in some pain, but she's okay. I felt bad uh, for her, obviously. Um, and then I found she called me later, and it, 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 the pain had gotten dramatically worse. Although the emergency clinic had given her a clean bill of health, she hadn't broken anything. It was pretty clear that something was wrong. And so she went on to get an MRI. She went to the hospital and um, got an MRI and to discover that she had a compression fracture, which is basically a, um, a crushing of the of the vertebra in the back, in her back. So now well, the question was what to do. And, you know, I thought, well, hey, I'm an expert on this because we have had many episodes on this, even on this exact problem. Because here, here, these were the choices. Choice number one was to do nothing. Uh, hope it got better. Choice number two was to get a special brace made that would allow the vertebrae to heal on their own, um, which 
I was told would take a couple of months, but but would avoid surgery. And choice number three was surgery. And there's different kinds of surgery in this particular situation, but there are variations on what's called um, perturboplasty, which we've talked about a number of times on this program. It's basically the injection of cement into uh, the, the, ver- the spinal column to uh, solidify the vertebrae back to where, where they were before the fall. And I don't know if you as listeners remember this, who, who were listening to the program back then, but I think we've done two episodes on why vertebroplasty doesn't work, uh, that it's a failure. Uh, let me just check. Um, let me see this. The first one was uh, back in, let's see, uh, 2016, Adam Sifu uh, had written a book with Benai Prasad. And the book was Ending Medical Reversal. And basically the idea of that book, which fascinated me and still does, is that many of the most common and implemented medical procedures which originally start off with some evidence in their favor, when they're looked at more carefully, they don't work. Or even worse, they are harmful. So in this case, uh, vertebroplasty, which was this uh, application of uh, cement into the spine, was finally tested against a placebo at some point and was found to be no better than the placebo. And the placebo was insane. The placebo was half the patients get the surgery where there's an incision made in their back and cement is is, uh, inserted. And the second group, they open the tube of cement so that the patient can smell it and believe that they're going to get this surgery, but they don't actually do the surgery. All they get is the, the smell. And the, this, this study with controls found that the actual surgery didn't do better than opening the tube of cement. And of course, the surgery is risky. Get infections, things can go wrong. Some people do it with anesthesia. Anesthesia always has risk associated with it. And I, the implication was that this procedure was an illusion or that the brain could fight the pain from the comp- the compression fracture on its own uh, once you smelled the tube of cement and had a belief, the placebo effect, that, that something had happened. I may have told the story. I'm going to make a side note for a, a different story. Uh, a friend of mine's a pain doctor. And uh, I went into his office. I was having uh, shoulder pain. Uh, I uh, damaged my uh, rotator cuff. And I went into his uh, office for a steroid shot. And it's a wonderful procedure. You, um, there's an imaging device that lets the doctor see exactly where the steroid is being inserted in the needle into the shoulder. And it's relatively painless, the insertion. And while we're waiting for the doctor, I was talking to the his nurse, and I said, what's your favorite thing in this office? And she said, oh, my favorite thing is when we inject cement into somebody's, ver- ver- into their spine, and they walk out pain-free. And this is right after I'd done the episode with Adam Sifu, and I wanted to say, you know, that's an illusion. That's just the placebo effect, but I didn't say anything. And years go by, and then my mom falls. So now I have to make a choice with my mom and my brother and sister consulting, the three of us with her. What should my mom do? Uh, Should she wear a brace for a few months? Should she, and hope it just heals on its own, which of course many times things heal on their own, which is why many procedures are overrated. Or should she get the surgery, which has, she's 91 years old. I'm thinking, this is insane. You're going to put an incision in her back? And her doctor insisted on general anesthesia. It just seemed like a terrible idea. 
So I called my friend, the pain doctor, and he said, um, oh, no, he said, you got to do the you got to do the cement. It's fantastic. He said, he said, often they walk out pain free. And I thought to myself, and I probably even told him, yeah, but that could be just the placebo effect. But then the truth is, is that, well, maybe that's the best way to get the placebo effect. I'm not really going to call her doctor and say, look, do me a favor. Instead of doing the actual procedure, would you just open the tube? I mean, it just seemed ridiculous. So we chose the surgery which, with great unease. Uh, actually, we tried the brace for like a day because that was, seemed like a really attractive. The brace works very well over in, in studies versus the surgery also. The problem is it's really hard to wear the brace. You put it on, it's like, it's not so bad. You wear it for 16 hours a day or whatever. Maybe you have to wear it for 24. It's insanely unpleasant. And to ask my 91-year-old mom to wear this brace for X months while this her back heels seemed insane. So we didn't do that. And we, we decided to do the surgery. And as we're waiting for the surgery to take place, my brother and sister and I are, of course, talking about it. And, and I'm also talking with my mom about it. And I, I didn't hide anything from her that I had this evidence that this procedure was not necessarily effective on its own, that it was something of a, of a sham with risks. But I had to make a call. The four of us had to make a call. And um, we decided to do the surgery. And, and was that rational? Was it irrational? I mean, should I have trusted the evidence of the study that Adam Sifu and Vinay Prasad presented in Ending Medical Reversal, that this, it was enough to open the tube? Should I have trusted the brace to have the effect and avoid the risk of invasive surgery, even though it was relatively, it's a small incision, risk of infection, the risk of the general anesthesia, I went into the surgery secondhand, of course. Um, I didn't enter it personally, but loving my mom, I went into that surgery with some actually tremendous unease. And, you know, I, I rationalized it, saying to myself, well, you know, I don't know how that study was done. That, that found it had no, it was no better than a placebo? Were there, was it really true that the people who were given the surgery versus the people who got the tube of cement opened, that they were, had the same level of pain beforehand? I mean, I, I just, I didn't know. But I was forced to confront the reality that I've talked about a number of times on this program that we feel very differently about omission and, and uh, commission. The doing things is different than things that happen because we take action are different from things that happen because we don't take action. You know, we've talked about the trolley problem as an example of this. But the truth is, in this case, it just seemed uh, really cruel to my mom at 91 to tell her, oh, yeah, this surgery doesn't really usually, it's, it's really not that effective. It, it, it only seems to be, and it's risky. So wear this brace for three months or whatever it was. It, it seemed absurd. So I bet on my, um, my friend, the pain doctor, who said it usually works. Um, and um, we did the surgery. And she walked out of that surgery pain-free. <laughs> Incredible. So, was it real? Was it a placebo? Um, I don't know. I, I meant to mention we did a, an episode with Gary Greenberg on the placebo effect. I think the vertebroplasty also came up in that episode. It's really crazy. So, um, pain's a bit mysterious. The brain-pain connection is very mysterious. Um, was she just getting the benefit of the placebo effect and the incision and the anesthesia turned out to be relatively risk-free in this case? 
did it actually do something that reduced the pain through stabilizing her back? Don't know. But I, I, that was the choice I made, and uh, or at least the position I advocated for with my brother and sister, who thought it was crazy that I would even consider not doing it. Um, you know, for them, again, the commission part of it seemed the right way to go, not the omission, not to do. They wanted to do something rather than nothing. And so did my mom. She wanted the pain to stop. And her doctor assured her that it often would stop after this. And so uh, we did it. And um, got a good draw from the urn, as they say. So I, I don't have... Um, I don't have much more to say about that. Be interested in any comments you have and anything else you have to say about what I have said before. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for being along for the ride, especially those of you who've been listening for 18 years. Uh, I would have never imagined uh, this journey. And um, it's been a great ride. I hope it goes, keeps going for, for some time. So thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>